Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the second talk of this workshop on effectiveness in the sciences. It's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Greg First Arnold, and he will be talking about uh, logics for languages with confused terms. So. Thanks, Luis. Uh, thanks also to Maria for all her hard work bringing together this fantastic workshop. Um, I'm really excited uh, to hear what everyone else has to say. I, I just think the idea of this workshop is inspiring uh, because you know a lot of times workshops are like, oh, get another workshop on scientific realism, or another one on scientific idealization, or another one on inconsistencies in science. And I think having this overarching idea of defectiveness is going to really help bring together some people who are working maybe in ways that are connected, but they don't realize it because they are used to just thinking, oh yeah, I do scientific realism, oh yeah, I do idealization. Okay, all right, so um, as we said, um, I'm going to talk about confusion. Um, this is actually, I'm, I feel very fortunate that Otavio went first and talked about semantic indeterminacy because confusion um, is one way of thinking about what's going on in the case of semantic indeterminacy. So, uh, the, the, the ground has already been set. Um, so what exactly do I mean by confusion? Um, the rough idea is basically you're confused when there is two or more things and you think there's just one thing. You, you, you conflated them, you confuse those two things. Um, what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of the talk is to give a couple of examples, um, the motivation, fine project, some basic concepts, and then we'll do some model theory and then we'll do some group theory. Okay, so the, the key concrete example I'm going to use to fix ideas um, and help us have a concrete um, thing to latch onto, I take from uh, Joe Camp. Uh, he wrote a book called Confusion um, uh, almost 20 years ago now. Oh, wow. Uh, and he has a story of um, this person named Fred. Fred goes to the pet store. And in the pet store, they sell ant farms. The ant farms come in a box. You can't see inside the box. Uh, but on the box it says, this box contains lots of small <laughs> ants and one big ant. However, there was a mistake at the ant farm factory, and two large ants actually got into the box. Um, we, in our language, uh, our unconfused language, we'll call those two ants, those two big ants, ant A and ant B. Fred, however, when he buys the, the box at the store, does not realize that there are two big ants. When Fred gets home, before he opens the box or anything, he just says, I'm going to call the big ant in my uh, ant farm, Charlie. Um, okay, so what the idea here is Fred is confusing ant A and ant B. Charlie is a confused name. Okay, so let's um, step back a second and have something a bit more uh, 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 abstract. So. Uh, the principle of univocality, um, Karnak introduces this in um, Meaning and Necessity, but the idea is codified in every classical logic textbook. Every name in a logically proper language refers to exactly one individual. When that condition is met, the principle of univocality is met. Um, as I said, it's assumed in classical first order logic. Um, and if you want to do it mathematically, we can say the principle of univocality states there is a total function from names in the language to individuals in the domain of discourse. Now note that there are two ways a name can violate this principle. One way is a name refers to too few things. So that's like non-denoting names, right? I thought we were just talking about like Vulcan uh, or Santa, right? Uh, that violates the principle of the individuality insofar as we see having a total function um, from the names to the individuals in the domain of discourse. Instead, we have a partial function from names to individuals. So there are some names that don't get mapped to any individual in the universe of discourse. This is studied in free logic and has been the subject of lots of investigations over many decades. The other way a principle, the principle of univocality could be violated is you have a name that refers to too many things. And that's what Charlie, what's happening in the case of Charlie, I think. In this case, 
if we're thinking about it in terms of model theory, in ter um, then we no longer have a function at all. Right? So free logic makes it a partial function. Um, this other case, we have to throw out the idea of a function from the names to individuals. We instead have a one-many relation from names to individuals. Um, I call this um, multiply signifying logic. Uh, it's like free logic. Um, or for short and more intuitively, the logic of confused or ambiguous terms. I, I'm not going to defend here the claim that multiply signifying logic is in fact the best way to capture our intuitive everyday notion of confusion. So that's why I say multiply signifying. It's so that I don't have to spend the time talking about whether multiple signification is confu everyday confusion. So if you're um, a visual thinker, uh, here's uh, my sort of like chart of how to understand what's going on in the Charlie case. There's Fred's language, there's our language. Fred has one name, Charlie, and that name refers to uh, uh, Aunt A and Aunt B. Um, in our language, we have a name Aunt A, we have a name Aunt B, and those refer univocally. So our language obeys the principle of univocality, uh, Fred's does not. Um, Note also that predicates can fail to be univocal, right? A single predicate could be associated with more than one extension, right? That, of course, is also forbidden in classical first order logic. Um, so I'm actually not that interested in Fred and Charlie and Ants. Um, I'm interested in cases where this happens in science. Um, and again, Octavia, thank you for setting me up so well here. Uh, one example that Arthur Field made famous is that if you inhabit the theory of special relativity and you look back at Newtonian mechanics, you'll see Newton says this word mass, and the question is, well, okay, what did it mean? Do you mean what I, in my special relativistic language, call relativistic mass, which is the total energy of an object divided by um, the speed of light squared, or do you mean the proper mass, which is the non-kinetic energy um, divided by the speed of light squared? So like this is, as Otago was saying, it, do you take the velocity of the um, body into account or not? So, um, here you go. Know, here you do. Okay. But there's lots, lots, lots more examples. And you might think, oh, yes, confusion is something for people in the past who made mistakes. No. Sometimes confusion is, well, yeah, progress. We, we, go, from, we go from past uh, distinctions that, we, in the, in, that later people say, oh, that's a distinction without a difference. So from the point of view of classical physics, like so if you're Newton, if you're Newton looking at um, uh, general relativity, Einstein thinks that there is no difference between inertial mass and gravitational mass. He calls them essentially identical. Um, and, and so Newton going on about inertial mass, right, which is resistance to a uh, change in velocity, and gravitational mass, which is the force that attracts mass bodies to each other. Those aren't two different things, and thinking about them as two different things is a mistake. Uh, whereas um, Newton says, yeah, no, those are separate things. So uh, if you remember, if you ever you know, have been exposed to Einstein's elevator thought experiment, that's the argument Einstein used for the essential identity, the, the physical identity of inertial mass and gravitational mass. Um, another example uh, we can draw from chemistry. So as the textbooks say, the, the word acid has three different definitions. There's Arrhenius' definition. He says, if you take an acid is something that if you put it into water and it dissolves, then uh, the concentration of um, H positive ion will increase. Ronsted Lowry and says, what is it? What an acid is, is anything that tends to donate protons in a chemical reaction. Um, and there's a Lewis definition. An acid can accept two electrons to make a covalent bond. Um, it's not just the physical sciences. Um, uh, it's also biological sciences. Um, when I was in high school and I took biology, uh, they told me about there's warm-blooded animals and cold-blooded animals. It turns out that warm-blooded and cold-blooded are both confused concepts. They bring together things that are actually three distinct things. They often talk, the three distinct things often talk together, but it actually is three different biological things and that they can come apart. So the three different sort of um, distinctions, uh, the three different you know, unconfused concepts are an endothermic animal is one whose primary energy source is food and not the sun, right? Uh, tachymetabolic, that just means you have a fast metabolism. 
Um, and homeothermic, that means they're a roughly constant internal temperature. Again, those three things often clump together, so that something that is endothermic will often always be, will often be tachymetabolic and homeothermic, but they don't always, they can't come apart. And there are lots more examples. So to have a, a more like logic or mathematical example, um, from the point of view of an intuitionist, a classical logician confuses not not P and P. Right? The intuition says not not P and P are two different claims. Uh, and the classical logician treating them as um, semantically identical and having the same meaning is a confusion. Okay. So that was a few examples, um, and just to give you the general idea of uh, where I'm coming from. Okay, so in free logic, remember that's the logic for non-denoting terms, uh, there's a taxonomy of semantics, and I'm just gonna borrow that taxonomy and just take it over. Um, the three types are uh, negative, neutral, and positive. Um, and so in a negative semantics for languages with confused terms, Every atomic sentence containing a confused term or a multiple signifying term is false. So, for example, in, when Fred says, Charlie is an ant, that's going to be false. Uh, the neutral semantics says every atomic sentence uh, that has a confused term is neither true nor false. So, Charlie is an ant, that is going to be, um, not, that'll be truth valueless. Um, and on positive semantics, the, uh, the idea is that there's at least one uh, atomic sentence. That ha with an ambiguous term that is true. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the case that every, you know, it's certainly not even the case that every single um, atomic sentence containing it, an ambiguous term is going to be true. Some may be truth valueless, some may be false, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so here's an example, um, just so we can work through it. Uh, so Charlie is Charlie, Charlie equals Charlie. So the negative semantics, we look back to the definition, okay, that's going to have to be false. The neutral semantics, the truth valueless. And the positive semantics, true, unless you're grand priest. And if you're grand priest, then you think you claim it's true and false. The idea here being that there is a way of disambiguating the sentence that makes it, there's a way of disambiguating that makes it true, assign and A to both of these, or and B to both of these. But there's two other disambiguations of grand priest, one where this is and A and this is and B, and that's going to be false, and this is and B. This is and B and this is and A, and that's false, right? So there's a true disambiguation, there's a false disambiguation of it, and therefore it's true and false. Okay. So who cares? I mean, maybe you're a logician and you're interested in these things for their own sake, but um, if you're not just a straight up logician who cares about these things for their own sake, um, this question of which of these three semantics we use has important implications to the pessimistic induction. Uh, and just so that you know exactly what I mean by pessimistic induction here. It's the argument that says past scientific theories weren't approximately true, therefore our present ones probably aren't approximately true either. That's close enough for present purposes. Because think about now what each of these three semantics would say if we, in my mind reasonably, look back at the history of science and say, oh look, there's a lot of confused language in what Priestley was saying. There's a lot of confused language in what Lavoisier was saying. There's a lot of confused language in what Newton was saying. If you go the neutral route, right, the truth valueless route, then it seems like you're going to land in semantic anti realism, right? Because past theories couched in confused terminology are going to be truth valueless. And a lot of people think that semantic anti realism is a non starter. So, if you're a proponent of the pessimistic induction and you don't want to commit yourself to semantic anti-realism, then you're going to have to reject the neutral semantics. If we go to negative semantics, this fits what I would call like the usual understanding of the standard interpretation of the pessimistic induction. The past theories were false, therefore the current theories are false. And so now we're not in the realm of semantic anti-realism, but rather epistemological anti-realism. Um, but also, if you're um, on the other side of the pessimistic induction um, debates, it might help the realists because even if past theoretical terms don't refer perfectly, nonetheless, scientists perhaps still could use that confused language to say true things, right? 
And so then when the real the anti-real says past times the experience weren't approximately true, the, the person who accepts this semantics can come on and say, no, 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 you're saying they're false or wrong because they have confused terms, but actually a bunch of those sentences are actually true. Um, even though, despite the fact that they use um, confused terminology. Um, there's a, a further issue here is that we can actually partially reduce Kuhn incommensurability. Um, because, so Kuhn, of course, says lots of things about incommensurability. But in his later work, um, incommensurability is identified as a kind of untranslatability. And if you think about our language and Fred's language, there's no way to translate Charlie directly into our language. Well, I'll actually, you're, you're going to have to take my word for that at the moment. You might think, yeah, of course there is, but I'm going to try to show you that there is um, in, in, in a couple of minutes. And furthermore, there's no way for, there's no way to translate Charlie into our language, there's no way to translate anti and B directly into Charlie's language, right? However, if, you, if we can say things like, oh yeah, Charlie is an ant, Charlie weighs less than 100 pounds, then, and say that those things are true, then it seems like we are able to compare theories, right? They're, they're not going to be, just because they're untranslatable, just because there's untranslatability between paradigms, between languages, doesn't mean that we can't compare. Okay, so that's, that's part of why you should care if you're a philosopher of science. Okay, so... You might say, well, wait, what do the positive semantics for confused terms look like? Um, here's the first approximation of it, and it goes back to Hartford Field's um, article from 1973. A sentence is super true, um, or we might just say truth. There's an argument about whether super truth is truth or true. Um, but a sentence is super true if it's true on every complete disambiguation of it. I, if in every single way you um, disambiguate Charlie, it comes out true, then the whole sentence about Charlie is true. It's false, super false, if it's false on every complete disambiguation, and it's neither true nor false otherwise. In other words, if on some disambiguations um, it's true and on others it's false, then the whole sentence is truth valueless. Okay, so concrete example. Charlie is eating is our sentence. If, at the moment this is uttered, both ant A and ant B are eating, then the super valuation says this sentence is true. If both ant A and ant B are asleep and not eating, then it's false. But if ant A is eating and ant B is not eating, the sentence is true fabulous, not true or false. Okay, so that's the basic idea. What does this look like model theoretically? So first, just a quick reminder, um, a classical model is an ordered pair, it's the thing of a domain and an interpretation function. D is the domain of quantification. Um, and the interpretation function assigns to every name in the language one element from the domain discourse and to each n place predicate a set of ordered n tuples from dn. A multiply signifying model, which is what we're going to use to represent confused terms, um, is has a domain exactly as before, but there's a difference. Instead of having an interpretation function, we have an interpretation relation which we explicitly allow to be one name. Right? So it's a one many relation, so each name uh, can be related to possibly many elements of the domain, and each n place predicate can be related to possibly many sets of ordered in tuples. Um, so, for example, um, the interpretation relation in the story I've told about Fred and his ant farm uh, the name Charlie and Aunt A, and the name Charlie and Aunt B. Those are the two um, uh, uh, things that Charlie refers to, and so the um, interpretation relation captures them that way. All right, all right, things are going to get a little complicated. Um, I'll try to keep it uh, comprehensible. Um, so in order to spell out the, all three of the semantics, positive, negative, and neutral, I'm going to start by creating what I'm going to call a restricted model from the multiply signifying model. And the basic, the, the core idea behind the restricted model is simple. You just treat multiply signifying names and predicates as if they fail to signify anything. We then get a partial interpretation function, FR restricted uh, function. The idea is basically you just throw away all the information from that you that is encoded in the um, multiply signifying model about uh, any confused terms. Okay? From there we can um, define truth in a restricted model. 
a sentence, and it's exactly what you would expect. A sentence is true in a restricted model if every term of that sentence is defined, right? So there's no uh, sentence, no terms are defined, which there would be if there's a confusion in there. And every sequence satisfies um, the formula, and A is undefined otherwise. So there's going to be, if there's confusion in the language, then there's going to be a lot of undefined sentences. Okay. Now things get a little bit complicated at this step. So when we when we start thinking about sentences containing the identity sign, the equal sign, think about the open formula x equals Charlie. Which values of x in our domain satisfy this formula? Well, you might. When I first asked myself this question, my answer was, well, both ante and ante. However, that is leads to disaster. Uh, because if we say, okay, if A equals Charlie is true, and B equals Charlie is true, then by transitivity of identity, and A equals and B. And that ain't true. Right. Um, interestingly, uh, Graham Priest um, bites this bullet and says, identity is not transitive in my system. Um, I say, I would like to keep identity transitive, please, um, if possible. So then you might say, okay, okay, I can't be both, so let's just take one. And make it just anti, or make it just anti. And I think that is not really rationally defensible because there's no reason to prefer one ant over the other. It's, the, the situation is entirely, completely symmetric. So then you say, okay, okay, make it a set anti consisting of the two elements anti and anti. That creates its own problems because then the name Charlie fails to be ambiguous. It refers univocally to that set. Um, additionally, the set and a and a, consisting of a, a, and b is an element of the domain. We can fix that by changing the domain. But furthermore, what on um, positive semantics, that I think we get really bad um, results because then Charlie is an ant, it be false because Charlie is a set, not an ant. And, and furthermore, Charlie is a set would be true, which seems weird, right? We want to say, like, if you're attracted at all to the positive semantics, then when this Fred, the ant owner, says to himself, Charlie's uh, an ant, right? You want that to be true. Okay. So it looks like nothing that I mean satisfies X equals Charlie. Um, you might think, oh, what about the merry logical fusion of ant and ant? I think that's going to have the same kinds of problems as this, um, because then Charlie has two heads, it's true. Charlie has 12. 12 legs, it's true. And that seems like it's wrong. Okay. Because it seems like nothing that I mean satisfies X equals Charlie, I impose the following condition on an atomic identity formula. So if you have a sense of the form T1 equals T2, where T1 and T2 can be names of variables, if exactly one of T1 and T2 is undefined, then no sequence satisfies that um, formula, and therefore um, that formula will be false in the restricted model. Note that as a result, there exists an X such that X with Charlie is false in the restricted model. Now, now that we have this, um, some, this truth definition for the restricted model in hand, we can define the, we can get a truth definition for neutral negative semantics. A sentence is true in the multiple signifying model on neutral semantics if it's true in the, multi, in the sorry, restricted model. Um, and for compound sentences, you can use both the strong or weak claiming schemes. It doesn't matter your choice. Um, for the negative semantics, Everywhere where the restricted model makes a determination of truth or falsity, you adopt that. And then for all the leftover undefined sentences, you make every single one of those. Well, it probably would start. All the leftover undefined atomic sentences, you make all of those false. Then, lucky you, you get to use just the absolutely classical um, rules for compound expressions because there's no more truth value of sentences. OK. So let's talk about making fields um, idea precise. Uh, he says, a sentence is super true, just to remind you, if it's true on every complete disambiguation, and super false, if it's false on every complete disambiguation. So we need to make the notion of a complete disambiguation precise. A complete disambiguation is a classical model that we create by disambiguating every ambiguous term in, in the multiple defined model. So right, um, in the case of Fred, there will be two uh, complete disambiguations. One where every instance of the name Charlie gets assigned to Aunt A, and another disambiguation in which every instance of the name Charlie gets assigned to Aunt B. Here's the problem, though. Note that there exists an X such that X equals Charlie is true in every complete disambiguation. 
Because right in this one, and A exists. Yep, that's true. In this one, and B exists. Yep, that's true. So Field's original proposal is wrong. You can't just say truth is truth in all this ambiguation because you end up saying that this is true and it's just that's not. So the solution to this is to always say, okay, if the truth value is set by the restricted model, always respect that one. We only use the complete disambiguations to settle the um, truth values of sentences left undefined by the earlier stage restricted model. Okay. Okay, now finally we can define super truth. A well formed formula is super true if and only if the sentence is true in, and this is just the ugly, clunky uh, symbols I used to say, in the, in the truth assignment where we always you know, respect the truth value assignments in the restricted model and then um, use disambiguation only to uh, to fill in the um, one left undefined by the truth model for every single disambiguation uh, of the multiple signifying model. So an extremely whatever abstract concrete example is much easier. Charlie is an ant, it's super true because there's true, two disambiguations, and in both disambiguations, um, it's true. Because ant A is an ant, and ant B is an ant. Charlie is over 10 feet long, super false, because ant A is under 10 feet long, and ant B is under 10 feet long. Charlie is asleep will be true fabulous if one of the ants is asleep and one is awake. And fixing the problem with field semantics, uh, there exists an such that equals Charlie is super false because it gets its truth value assigned at this earlier stage at, at the um, restricted model. Okay. So question, which of the three semantics is the right one? I don't know. I suspect the question may not have an answer. I've actually done, um, I was lured into doing some experimental philosophy on this, which we can talk about at the end if you want. Um, but I know I, I have a, we did a, I did with a, an experimenter uh, a study of some people's native you know, sort of, uh, natural naive reactions to questions about Charlie. Now, a full list of the advantages and disadvantages of these semantics would be very long, but here are the things that I think are most important. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The main negative of the positive semantics in my mind is that the negative and neutral semantics are just simpler than the positive semantics. It's just, it's like you saw how complicated it got getting it to work. And, and like in, in, the, in the negative semantics, right, you get to use the classical uh, rules of um, first order logic. So it's, you don't have to have these weird um, uh, logical systems. The main pro in my mind of using the positive semantics though, is that negative neutral semantics assimilate multiply signifying terms to non-signifying terms. They treat Charlie the same as Santa. But I think like Charlie and Vulcan uh, to use a obvious example, I think they're different. In just in the exact same way that one divided by zero is different from the square root of four, right? We can say the square root of four um, is less than or equal to eight. But we can't say like one divided by zero is less than or equal to eight. So the, the concern is that neutral negative semantics throw away information in the, that's present in the multiply signifying model. Okay. What does all this have to do with proofs? Or not what have to do, but like how, how does thinking about confused terms um, play out in terms of proof rules? So as I mentioned at the beginning, right, a lot of what I'm doing is very much building on what people are doing in free law, have already done in free logics. And in, right there, just to remind you, look, those are the logics where the names don't necessarily denote anything like Vulcan or uh, Santa Claus. So in those logics, the classical uh, universal elimination and exist introduction rules are not valid, just to show you why that's true. Pretend we live in a materialistic universe, which no Cartesian minds or anything like that. Everything is spatio-temporally located. That's true in the materialistic universe. Therefore, Santa is spatio-temporally located. No, he is not anywhere. Right. So it's not valid. This one's true, this one's false. Exist intro. Santa is not spatio-temporally located. That's definitely true, right? Because Santa doesn't exist. He doesn't have spatio-temporal location. 
Therefore, something is not spatio-temporally located. That's false in the materialistic universe. So again, we have true premise, false conclusion. So those rules, those classical rules, aren't valid in free logic. What happens to those two rules in multiply signifying logic? So let's do the exact same uh, situation, except instead of talking about Santa, we'll talk about our friend from using hands. Um, so we've got everything is spatially temporally located, therefore Charlie is spatially temporally located. Charlie's not eating, but something is not eating now. We do have two arguments. So on the negative semantics, um, it'll be no in both cases, right? Because um, this will be true and this will be false. Um, this will be true because Charlie is eating uh, is false. We've got the not to make it true. That's something is not eating now. I mean, it, that could be true, but we can imagine a universe in which literally every single thing is eating. We can restrict the universe of discourse to things that can eat and everything's eating. Um, for the neutral semantics, again, this will be true and this will be truth valueless, so it won't be truth preserving, right? This one, however, will be truth preserving, but only because this sentence is going to be always truth valueless. So it can never go from truth to the untrue. What's interesting to me is that for the positive semantics, both of these things are going to be true. If everything is spatio-temporally located, that means and A and and B are both spatio-temporally located. Therefore, Charlie is spatio-temporally located. So this is going to be true because it's true on both disambiguations. Charlie's not eating now, right? So neither and A is eating now, nor is and B eating now. So something's not eating now. Yeah, that's, that's true. So now you might think, oh, look, the proof rules um, don't have to change at all. Not so fast. Again, identity messes us up. Instead of the following arguments on a supervaluational semantics, um, for all x, x does not equal c, right? There's nothing in the domain that's equal to Charlie. That's true. But Charlie is not equal to Charlie. That's false on a supervaluational semantics. So this rule, this rule is not truly preserved um, on a supervaluational semantics. And there's a sort of similar one for the centro. Charlie equals Charlie, therefore there's a something that equals Charlie. Again, premise is true, conclusion is false. So, oh, right, that's what I just said. Um, so the classical rules are unsound in confused languages with the equal sign. Um, it's what we just learned. So here's an open question that actually I hope people whoops, think about and help me with and you know, work on themselves is if we adopt um, a supervaluational semantics for a confused language containing the equal sign, what's the best way to modify the proof rules um, for some combination of these four? I honestly don't know where to do it. Like, um, yeah, I, this is something that you don't need a lot of practice doing um, as uh, like when you're just studying like logic one one It's like, okay, you have, you have to come up with an entirely new proof system now. How are you gonna do it? And I say, I don't know. Um, but I, I think that's an interesting question and one that's uh, worth it. Investigate. So, coming back to the other um, semantics for a minute, um, it turns out that free logic has sound and complete proof systems for both the negative semantics and the neutral semantics. And so, a natural hope is that, hey, can we just borrow those and take them over to the confused case? And the answer for the negative semantics, the one where everything, all the atomic sentences with confused terms are false, is happily yes. Um, the proof is possibly but not difficult. Um, unfortunately, um, the proof system of neutral free logic is not sound on the neutral um, multiply signifying semantics. The reason is this kind of a sentence. So in free logic, this is a theorem. Why? Because um, in free logic, um, the variables can't denote nothing. Each variable, I should say denote variables can only range over things that actually exist in the domain. Um, so you can't have a non-denoting variable. That's, that's the right way. And furthermore, free logic doesn't allow any semantic funniness, <coughs> semantic weirdness at the level of predicates. So that's why nothing um, non-classical creeps into that sentence in neutral free logic. Um, however, in the neutral, I'm um, we'll signifying semantics, it's not a logical truth because this could be like 
Newton, this could be like Newton's mass, right, from the point of view of special relativity. But this could be warm blooded, right? Everything warm blooded is warm blooded. The neutral uh, semantics is going to call that truth valueless. So it's not a logical true. Um, happily, uh, if you care, the neutral free logic system is complete with respect to the neutral confused semantics. So, that, so you can half you can half bring over the work that's already been done. What about positive multiple signified proof rules? Okay. Um, we can't carry over the proof system for super valuation free, free logic um, because the only sentences with funny terms that positive free logic makes for theorems, like if Santa is happy, then Santa is happy. Santa is happy or Santa is not happy. So we need another proof system that's at least sound and maybe complete. Now, there's two different ways to cash out the notion of logical consequence in the multi signifying language. Super valuational consequence, um, and oh, I'll just put it up so we can look at both. Semi classical consequence. The idea here is if every premise is super true, i.e., true on every disambiguation, then the conclusion is also true on every disambiguation. That's super valuational. Semi classical consequence is instead you look at the whole argument under a single disambiguation. So you say, under the first disambiguation, if all the premises are true, is the conclusion false? No? Okay. Under the second disambiguation, are all the premises true and the conclusion false? No. Okay. Under the third disambiguation, right? So that's that's the difference. So in every disambiguation, if all the premises are true in that disambiguation, then the conclusion is true in that disambiguation. Um, just so you have a sense of how these can come apart, Charlie is eating, thus every big ant is eating is super valuationally truth-preserving, but not semi-classically truth-preserving. Because um, if only A and A is eating and A and B is not, then it's, it won't, the premise won't be super true, and so we don't have to worry about it um, uh, uh, being invalid. But in the disambiguation where Charlie is assigned A and A, right, the premise is true, but the conclusion is false. Okay. Now, as we saw above, um, in languages containing identity sign, classical versions of universal elimination and existential are not sound on positive semantics. <coughs> However, classical first order logic is sound for languages without identity on both the semi classical and the supervaluational notions of consequence. Right? So, to me, that's an interesting result. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not, in some ways, it's not super surprising, but it's at least a little bit surprising and interesting that um, if you have the right, if you pick the right semantics, then we don't have to change the, well, I should say we have to change. The, the, the proof rules that we use in classical logic will not break down even if we introduce confused terms into our language. Okay. Um, and furthermore, if you, if you choose to say, if we're talking about the semi-classical notion of consequence, then the classical proof rules of first order logic are complete. So if you go to the classical consequence route, then there's no change necessary. Um, Supervaluational consequence can be fin finitely axiomatized, so there's not a completeness uh, possibility there. All right, so uh, no, I don't want to talk about this. So just uh, takeaways. So why study confused languages? Um, I think there's logical reasons, which is just basic curiosity. Like, I'm curious. You know, you told me in my logic textbook, you have to assume every name refers to exactly one individual. What happens if I don't? I would like to know um, what, what, what occurs if I give that up. Furthermore, we get this, I think, interesting result that at least if we leave, if we leave I, the identity predicate to one side, ambiguity does not mess up the classical proof rule. Right, which is weird because one of the reasons people give for why should you study formal logic in the first place is, oh yes, natural language is full of ambiguities and it leads to all these errors. It doesn't lead to any errors, right? We can use those same truth rules and it won't lead us to errors if we just have the right semantics. Um, for applications to the philosophy of science, as I mentioned earlier, right, the, is the pessimistic induction actually an argument for semantic anti-realism that we should think that our current theories are neither true nor false in important chunks of them? Um, and this idea that I mentioned also earlier, that um, against Kuhn, we don't, we can say, yeah, Kuhn, untranslatability between paradigms happens, but we don't have to say that that necessarily is same ability. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Greg. Um, we have time for some questions.
Okay, so um, not a logician, but um, a question. And so you were talking about the unitarity <coughs> requirement for names and for predicates. Can you maybe say something more about um, how that requirement um, is cash out for predicates? Oh, just the idea that, um, I mean, uh, all the, almost all of the, well, let's see. So like the example of warm-blooded, right? So the idea there is that there are actually, you know, these three different traits. And so the idea is that the, if we have a name or a name predicate warm-blooded in our language, the um, interpretation relation will take that name to the set of endothermic. So like one of its extensions will be the set of endothermic organisms. Another extension will be the set of whatever those things. I, I forgot what the three fancy words are. But like there's three different extensions. Like so three different sets of animals that that one predicate is related to. Okay, so in a sense that predicate refers to the distinct other predicates. To sets. To, th to sets of like sets of like actual individuals. Animals in the world. <laughs> oh. Whatever animals that there are that are endothermic. Um, thanks. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. There's a lot going on there. Um, one question, since you're unable to choose between the three semantics, um, and given that they don't agree in terms of the outcomes, doesn't that introduce uh, another level of ambiguity or confusion? Because then we, we're unsettled about, okay, which of these inferences go through and which doesn't. Right. So uh, actually, yeah, so good. I mean, to me, that to me, that's an extremely good point, which I had never thought of before, and I really should have. Um, but I mean, to me, that almost makes it more pressing to figure out which is the best, at least for a given application, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I did not mean to say that it is impossible to figure out what is the right semantics, especially if, you're, if you pick an application, right? I, there may not be one that's best for everything everywhere. Um, but yeah, to me, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. And to me, it just drives home, like, it's actually important. I should include that on my slide of why I care which semantics you use. Mm -hmm. right. uh, my question is, uh, why uh, do you think it's important to retain uh, the transitivity of our identity? Because it seems to me that in a, in a context where terms are ambiguous, uh, it would be Something has to go with identity. You cannot say that something bad is identical. But yeah. No, that is a, that is a that is a genuinely good point, and I've, I've thought about it a lot, and I honestly don't know. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll tell you what's motivating me, and um, then you can decide whether that's at all <laughs> that makes sense. Which is that um, I'm thinking about how to understand the thoughts and utterances and inferences of this guy, Fred, the guy who owns that ant colony. And to think that we should say, oh, Fred, your problem is really that you think A equals B and B equals C entails A equals C. Like, is that the mistake he's making? It seems not, right? Whereas, so, it, and I, again, like I said, I'm not sure how <laughs> how forceful you find that consideration, but that's it. That seems like that's not the mistake he's making. <laughs> but I, but I, I also I, I feel the force of, of your suggestion too. Like there's a part of me that I feel that. Part. <laughs> me? Yeah. It's, yeah. How about substituting the, the notion of identity with one of similarity, and and, and just having symmetry and the flexibility, but no longer. Transitivity in, in that way, you could have a Charlie be similar in a certain aspect to what you call a uh, no, uh, the, the, the ant A is similar to Charlie, and Charlie is similar to A to the to the to the other ant, yeah. <laughs> but similarity would oh, not allow the transitivity, and therefore you wouldn't have such a problem. That's an interesting idea, and I guess, yeah, I'll have to think about that. I, yeah. 
I guess, yeah, I just assume, you know, I'm working in this world. So that, that's a very good idea. I, know, yeah, I, just, I think I've been a little bit blinkered and thinking like, okay, you know, logical languages, a lot of times they want to have an interpretive identity predicate and just throwing that in there, right? And so maybe we can save a lot of the stuff that we think should be saved with the idea of similarity predicate. That's, that's really nice. Thank you. One more question. <laughs> So you were saying uh, you're not uh, pretending to say which is the right semantics, maybe we can't really, but you do uh, sort of have an idea on what is relevant to preserve and what to let go. Do you have an idea on what relevance would be? How to decide? No. <laughs> like, that, 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 that's a totally legit question. I just, I mean, to me, it's a matter of like strength of considered intuitions. So, right, I, I want to preserve that ant A does not equal ant B, <laughs> right? Um, if, 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 if that turns out um, to be false, then I feel like I've done something wrong. Um, but yeah, that's an extremely good question, and it's one that I don't have a really satisfying answer to. Just because I quickly mentioned it and didn't, oh, no word. Is it not in this version? There it is, okay. I actually did do <laughs> survey results. Uh, so I, I took a survey of a bunch of undergraduates um, and asked them questions um, about, uh, we tell the story of Charlie, and we tell them like, okay, what, uh, what do you think about is the truth value of the following sentences? And we give them the options. You can say it's true, false, both, neither, or don't know. And so for example, for Charlie's hand, 82% of the respondents said, yeah, that seems true, right? Um, Charlie's an elephant, 86.8% uh, said it's false. So like, for me, I want to preserve those if possible, right? So um, that, that, that's one consideration. I, I don't consider it like a definitive or like a final answer, but that's one of the things I'm trying to balance when I'm thinking about that question. So. Okay. Yeah. Really good. No, both of you. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a follow-up. Yeah. For instance, for the case of science, it seems that there, there should be something like at least a uh, at least uh, set of criteria that can help you to evaluate which are the good, the things that are going to be relevant and to measure how relevant they could be in the different cases. Can I have an okay. example or like the kind like? I, I get the impression that, for instance, when, when you were talking about uh, Bob Lovett <laughs> and, and, and different things that you refer to, then there are certain constraints in the disciplines and the, and the groups that they work with that can allow you to like to prefer certain type of inferences towards the, the connections that you make between the oh. term and the sets. Mm -hmm. And the things that you cannot do, for instance, that definitely you cannot do. Okay, I, mean, I guess it depends. Like, if the, I mean, it might be the biologists just say, let us remove the word warm blooded from every single one of our textbooks and articles and whatever, and then like loops the unconfused language. So, I mean, I guess I'm confused. I don't, I'm not sure why. I mean, if, if somebody, if, if, if I can understand that your point, your point seems very good, if like there's some groups that still want to use, warm-blooded, right? And then the other groups have to like talk to them. So like, you know, this is not right. But like molecular biologists, developmental biologists need to talk to each other and need to understand each other. And if this group thinks this group is saying something confused, right? They have to make sense of what these folks are doing as best they can. Um, but yeah, I hadn't thought about that as a possible constraint. And that's a really good idea. I should think about, yeah, how maybe other scientific practices, other you know, scientific groups might create constraints for which is the right something Thank you. Thank you. It's just a, a curiosity about the survey. Do you have any idea what uh, the students may have thought uh, that C is an end is false? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, I mean, this number, we had a, we had a much larger number for students. So that, this is actually, you can see it starting number two. The first question is, 
how many large ants are there? And 20% of the students got that wrong. So, so, so we had a comprehension check question at the beginning. And so this is like, somebody just misspelled the out or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, but it shows up also on the reverse when it sees an elephant, right? Yeah. There is someone who thought right, it's there's, true. There's like one or two people who thought it's true. <laughs> yeah, somebody was told enough or something. I don't remember. I had two drinks the night before. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Greg, for the Thank you. Question. Thank you, Luis. <laughs> Five minutes to work and uh, well. Uh, so, you have another time? I think you can just do that. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a slide. So I, I can send you the slides, but I have a draft of one paper that's like um, the proof theory part, and then there's another whole paper that's about this stuff, if you're interested in this stuff. That's a, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So yes, I, I could definitely send you that. Um, and the first part, like when I was doing the semantics, a lot of that, not all, but most of it, has already been published in the Journal of Philosophical Logic. Several years ago, but there's no one else named Greg Frost on it. So just Google Greg Frost on